here we go. Hi there, my name is Kendrick, and today I get to interview Ben. So Ben, welcome. Howdy, Kendrick. Uh, thanks for having me. And this is the part where I introduce myself and my type, yeah? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so, well, cheers, uh, YouTube audience and uh, Kendrick. So thought I'd crack open a beer, you know, as we rock and roll through this. Mm -hmm. So my type, uh, according to Myers-Briggs, is many things revolving around intuition. Uh, but I was typed by Joyce Meng as an ENTP. And according to the UPS system, I'm also an ENTP, more specifically, double feminine, N-E-F-E, -E, play, blast, consume, number four. So it's my full type. Cheers. Sleep last. I got your sleep last, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. Yeah. I, I'm just going to rant a little bit. I hate it when people say I'm missing this I'm missing the fourth animal like, you're not missing it people can use their fourth animal so it's just a little, a little bit of a pet peeve i'm like you're not missing it you have it you can use it so anyways i'll i'll, I'll leave it at that um uh, but uh and also your intro couldn't be more info dominant <laughs> like that is so info dom uh that was so good um uh, you are definitely like a pure blooded info dom which is which is great thank you thank you <clears throat> yeah um so Ben, um, what did you think and how did you feel when you got your official OPS typing results back? Yeah, so, well, I think it's interesting, uh, you know, that you mentioned that about sleep. Um, I'm someone who, I think I've like shifted between many types um, in the Myers-Briggs land over the years. I think even if, you know, for those people in the OPS community, I don't like, I'm essentially like the most craziest extroverted type theoretically. And, I don't typically come off as that. Um, I hope in our conversations, I'm coming off as sort of well thought out and reasonably well put together, uh, which my impression is that's how I tend to come off uh, typically um, in the rest of my life. So I've been like, I would always be typed some kind of intuition, something or other in Myers-Briggs land. So it would always be like, ENTJ, INTJ, and then it was like, oh, maybe ENFP, no, uh, ENFJ, INFJ, maybe ENTP, and then, yeah, so as I mentioned, the lovely Joyce Meng, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting, um, she was able to type me as uh, ENTP, she was like, that is not introverted intuition up top, that is wild and crazy extroverted intuition, and uh, yeah, I got my type. Um, in January of 2023. So I've sat with my type for a while and, you know, really tried to process it, really tried to push at it, um, tried to make sure that I was like really understanding the way things manifested, um, really, you know, like wrestling with, you know, do I do this? Do I display like that, etc. I convinced my parents to get typed as well. And so for the audience, um, if you can think of a mix of two types, which would create my type, uh, that's more or less what they are. It's, um, so my mom is a double feminine INTP. So that's T-I-N-E, consume, play, sleep. And of course, last, last. <clears throat> and then my dad is a double feminine, uh, ISFJ, S-I-T-I, -I, um, sleep, blast, play, consume last. So my mom is a number three and my dad's a number four. So I was raised in a house with a lot of masculine TI. So I would say my uh, masculine TI is very well developed. And I think the other thing that probably helps me, you know, gives me a nice little leg up is that... Uh, I find as like the, uh, you know, lead any, I don't know how you feel about this, but like my, uh, my counterpart IJs, like they just, they tend to like sort of scratch like this itch, you know, in the back of the brain and just kind of calm things down a little bit. So it was quite helpful that my dad is like the super, super chill uh, IJ of kind of like exactly the opposite type as me. So yeah, it's, um, 
it's been a wild and crazy, I think, typing journey, but that's where I'm at. Okay, uh, a few thoughts based on what you said. So my NE got um, activated here and I have like multiple, like I guess, trajectories now that I, I'm thinking based on what you just said. Uh, the first one is, oh my God, your entire family is in the same quadra. Like, you know, that, that's insane. Yeah. Like I said, the alpha quadra is what it is. Like you guys are all um, in the same, you know, like, you know, ENTP, INTP and ISFJ, are they're, they're the same, right? You guys are just missing an ESFJ to complete the set. Um, and you guys yeah, have the exactly. full combination. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is everyone in your family is double feminine. I'm like, what the heck? How did that happen? It's like the the most double feminine, um, uh, you know, group group of people. Uh, very interesting that 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 happened for sure. Um, so, and the other thing that you said, um, about the IJ scratching the itch of the EP, yeah, I totally relate. Um, you know. My girlfriend's an INTJ, so totally nice. uh, that it, it it definitely uh it definitely um the pairing does work uh it it, it does work very well, and then uh, there was something else that you said about um NE which I forgot now, so maybe I'll leave that because I, I don't remember, um. But uh, crazy any up top? Oh no no so yes yes so earlier you said that uh even though you're the most extroverted. ENTP type supposedly, you know, mm -hmm. um, not the most extroverted, like you, you would have to be double masculine to be even more extroverted, but um, you're almost there. Like you're pretty much there. Like play blast can seem sleep, right? Um, it's interesting that you said that you, you weren't as, you didn't seem as crazy as like the typical play blast can seem sleep um, version of, of your type. And then I was thinking about when you said that, I was like, oh, um, just yesterday, my mom and my girlfriend were chatting with each other. And my mom was describing, mm -hmm. um, me and my sisters to my girlfriend. And then my mom, when my mom described me to my girlfriend, my mom said, oh, Kendrick, he was actually very quiet and kept to himself when he was a kid. I was like, what the hell? And I was like, <laughs> I, was, I was like, I was like introverted as a kid, you know? Um, and then I thought about it. I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't go full on extrovert until I was in, um, um, I guess you could say my teens and also in my mid twenties. Cause I, 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 and I, I don't know if you experienced this and maybe you can share with me. Um, you know, the interesting thing, thing about our type is we're both quite similar. We're both the play blast and seem sleep, right? It's like, mm -hmm. uh, we, both of us would swing heavily, extreme extrovert and extreme introvert, you know, play blast and it could seem sleep. And depending on where, where you are in your face in your life, you could be extremely introverted or extremely like extroverted. Um, can you share, um, how you feel about that swing for, for you personally, you know, the play blast and the can seem sleep, um, swing? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go for, go for. You got another follow up. I want to. Yeah. Oh yeah, and and the, the other follow up too is um, it's not just play blast consume sleep um swing that you're having, your play and your blast are both feeler animals, and your consume and sleep are thinking. So not only are you going extreme extrovert and extreme feeling, you go to extreme introvert and extreme logic, right? It's the opposite of me. My play blast is the logical one, and my consume sleep is emotional. So, but it's kind of a similar thing happening between the both of us with uh, some differences. But anyways, uh, yeah, please share on, you know, how you experience that. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, you pointed out one difference, which is that you have TE, whereas I have FE. And I think the other difference is that you are diagnosed as a number two, and I'm diagnosed as a number four. <clears throat> and so I have this uh, theory about, you know, the numbers and sort of like the tribe um, like where they were in the tribe. And so I, my theory is that, you know, like the number ones, you know, whenever you'd encounter like the strange group, you know, like who could kill you, they could be friendly. Like you didn't know what to do. Like the number ones would be the ones who would like walk out there and puff out their chests. And the number fours are the ones who would like, you know, kind of like hang back and watch and just like make sure everything was safe. Right. Cause it's, again, it's the coin of like, um, inner, uh, sort of, pressure versus external pressure, right? And so, you know, I'm sort of like thinking about how that plays out now in the real world. And a lot of fours, you know, seem to be like pretty extroverted, you know, and like people love to be around them. And I think like the world is a much safer and less chaotic place now, you know, than it was like 6,000 years ago. And if you look at someone like me, I, uh, I think I moved like every single year you know, the first five years of my life, 
um, like major moves, you know, pretty typically. And then uh, from like fourth grade through like ninth grade, I was basically making a major move or a major change like every single year. Um, and then my life since then, I've, I've had some pretty significant change. Of course, an American living in Germany, currently on a business trip in uh, Warsaw. You can get a little picture of that. Um, and basically, uh, what I've noticed about myself, and this may be sort of a number four, is that, you know, the number four, you know, may be constantly scanning the environment, right? Or more so than, say, like a number one. at the other end of the spectrum. And so like when you get to this feeling of like safety, when you're just like, okay, it's a safe situation, like that's when the energy is released. And that's when like, like you know, all the craziness and sort of like inner tech comes out. Whereas I think like, you know, if someone was a number one, they would just like, they would be looking entirely like to the inside, right? No matter what their sort of um, function stack was. And they would just sort of rock and roll with whatever they've got. Um, so that's one sort of idea that I have, but I mean, you could also say that maybe I'm just like as lead any, maybe it's like the fact that my SI was constantly changing, like maybe that sort of, you know, made me a little less, uh, extroverted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause like, I do notice that like when I'm with like people I know, um, pretty well, like. I'm pretty extroverted, right? Like, but when I'm in a new situation, I'm just very observant and very sort of quiet. So maybe that's kind of what you were doing. You were figuring things out as a kid. Um, well, Dave explained that phenomenon in, in the sense that he said that uh, the tribe of self needs permission from the tribe first before they can kind of go, you know, crazy with their animals and whatnot, um, especially the extroverted ones. Like uh, Dave had a, Dave and Shan did an in-person meetup in Seattle. And uh, I got a chance to go there. And then the most extroverted person was an ENFP, actually. She was a consume, play, blast, sleep. And then the way that Dave explained it was that the ones who are self about tribe, they don't need permission from the tribe to go and express themselves. You know, they don't have to do what we both have to do first, which is scan the surrounding first and kind of get an understanding and also see where we place in the social hierarchy of things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or we can go crazy. Of course, we can go crazy once we're in. Um, once, once we're part of the yeah. tribe, we can go all out. <laughs> Um, so I don't know about me when I was a kid, personally, I think when I was a kid, um, I also moved a lot like you did. So I was constantly in a new environment. So I think I was looking for my tribe and, and when I did find my tribe, I did go all in the extrovert, but mm -hmm. before I found my tribe, um, I was keeping to myself like in a corner, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think our social type does make a big difference because you are four. So you're a little bit more passive than I am. I, I am a number two. So mm -hmm. when I was a kid and I would go to the playground, I would actually re recruit kids to join my my tribe, right? I would be like, okay, we're friends now. You're in this group. And then I'm the one that's organizing, you know, get togethers, like coming over to play video games at each other's house or play basketball or watch a movie. And I did that throughout high school. And, you know, I've always taken like the leadership role because I'm, I'm in the number two, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that's where we a little bit differ, uh, you know, between the two and four. Not saying force can't uh, organize stuff. Of course you can. Uh, but it's, I think you, if like a number two would do it or number one would, I don't know if number ones would do it because they're demon friends. But like, let's say a number, you have a number two friend that's doing it. You're going to be like, okay, you do stuff. I'll tag along, have fun. You know, do you, do you re resonate with that sentiment a little bit there? Yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, what you said is basically like, Once we sort of slot into the tribe, you know, we can sort of let out the function stack appropriately. Yeah. Or, um, and that that definitely makes sense to me. Um, the I think the piece about fours and twos, yeah, I think that also, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think like as a four. You know, I, you know, when I was a kid, I would just like go to like the playground and I would like talk with kids and stuff like that. And like, um, I think I sort of, yeah, because you have a uh, feminine D, right? As well. Yeah. yeah. I, I have double feminine play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like, I've got feminine DE as well. And so I think like, for me, you know, where 
I would sort of interact. I wouldn't be like saying like, here, come over, let's do this thing. I sort of like, uh, you know, like egg people on, you know, with kind of like what they're doing. Um, so like, What do you mean? you Yeah, know, like when I would, like, I don't like, well, egg people on, egg people on for like, you know, like bad stuff, but it's just like, you know, when you'd be at like a, a party in college or something like that and somebody's like, oh, you know, like, what about this? It'd be like, yeah, yeah, you know, Oh, like, just I see. like You're encouraging. excited with them. You're encouraging people to do bad things because you're because you're an EP, kind of like. Well, you know, like I'm like, I'm also trying not to like go too overboard with this, but like Yeah. I'm encouraging greater OE. Okay, I like I like how you branded <laughs> that way. Greater OE. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. But uh yeah, we are pretty similar. You've got the masculine SI sitting at the bottom, sort of staring up at you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's there. I actually noticed something interesting about SI. Actually, um, I was when I was traveling in um uh, Poland, I was in Krakow, right? I didn't want to leave my accommodation because you know, you know, you know, it's, we're weird with the SI. Like we want to, we we like our box. It's like a it's a weird thing, you know, with the SI at the bottom. Um, you know, even though we're both EPs, like with that SI makes us very like IJ like almost. Like we like to stay home a lot, but um, Yep. and like, we don't have SE right, so. like new physical environment is a little bit intimidating, you know, like new ideas are not because we have the any, right? Oh yeah. Bring in the new ideas. No problem. But like a new physical environment, that's a little bit like intimidating. But then I, I, I was thinking in my head, I was like, you know what, Kendrick, if you want to get comfortable in the city as fast as possible, you have to do the SE because the moment you gather um, new physical data uh, or explore new environments, it's no longer new. It's now SI. And uh, the moment it becomes SI, it's no longer intimidating. So I forced myself on my first day in Krakow to go for like a, I think I did like a three hour walk or something, like all around the whole town. And I was like really anxious the whole time because it's like completely new and environment was something I'm not used to. And, you know, language is different. So, but I forced myself. And I noticed on the second day when I tried to explore again, that Uh, anxiety is significantly less because it's now SI. I'm familiar with it now, you know? Isn't that weird? Have you ever experienced that for yourself where like the, the physical environment is weird at first, but the moment it's SI, it's like, oh, comfort city, you know? Like, I wonder if this is, like, an SI thing to, like, walk everywhere, because, like, that's what I do whenever I, like, go someplace. Like, I had this um, two-month tour of Europe when I was in college, Yeah. and, like, I would just, like, go to the city and just, like, walk everywhere. Um, but then what I found is that, like, <clears throat> so I went to Naples uh, in March, and basically, you know, I, like, walked around, you know, and then... you know, like the first two or three days, you're like constantly hitting out new places. And then by like day number four, like the essay is like, SI is like, okay, like we know this, like, where's the new and exciting? Like, and he's like, where's the new and exciting? I've seen all this physical stuff before. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It it it's it is definitely weird. Um, you know, with the NE and SI access for sure. Um yeah, because I remember um the first I think two weeks I was doing more exploration, but the last two weeks I didn't I didn't even want to leave my place anymore. Not because I felt anxious, but I'm like same old, you know, kind of deal. I'm <laughs> like no longer Yeah. interesting. So Yeah. And this is, this is where I think like the sleep blast, like really comes back to haunt me because I'm just like, you know, like go, go. Okay. Feed me the new ideas, new ideas, new ideas. Feed me, feed me, go. Right. And so it's like, um, you know, it's like, I mean, even something like uh, traveling, like I'm, um, I'm fairly impressed because you've been to over a hundred places, right? Yeah, 102 countries that I've been Ooh, to. Yeah. nice, nice. A little flexible. Um, Yeah. What, what, um, but, uh, like for me, like I, I sort of, you know, did my travel, uh, in Europe, you know, and I hit like a few, like 20% of what you hit. <laughs> um, but like, you know, now I'm a little bit younger than you. So I'm like 35. Right. And I think you're a few years older. Um, if I remember some of your other videos, but Basically, what I find is my SI is like, oh, another, you know, sort of city in Western Europe with vaguely similar buildings to something I've already seen. And I'm just like, where is like the alien civilization that I can explore? <laughs> Oh my God, I relate to that so much. Like I need to see that the alien landscape or or city, like the weirder it is, the better, you know? Yeah, dude. So I went to Kiev 
um, twice in 2023, and that was a fabulous experience. Like, You went there during the war? yeah. How did you end up there? What happened? Like, I'm curious now. What the heck? Dude, I like went there on purpose because I was just kind of like, well, first of all, I did the math and I was like, okay, what is the uh, murder rate in Ukraine? Like before the war. And then I said, okay, what is the murder rate in the cities that are away from the front line or like the provinces away from the front line? And you can crunch those two numbers. <clears throat> um, and you can say like, okay, if I go to Kiev, Kiev is like the most pro well-protected city, you know, with like the Patriots and stuff like that. And I did the math and I was like, okay, if I go to uh, Kiev, um, my, the odds of me being murdered will be like, about equal to like the rough odds of being murdered in like the US. And I was like, oh, okay. That's so sad. Yeah. So I was taken care <laughs> of. that's pathetic Yeah, yeah. for the US <laughs> to have that same statistic. Um, Yeah. um, so you went there twice. How did you even get there? I thought you can't fly to Kiev. Did you take the train to Lviv first? Take the bus for 30 hours from Hamburg. That Oh is God. a trip. <laughs> God, jeez. Yeah, I've been there before the war, so I don't know what it's like during the war. Maybe you can share with me. We can uh, nerd out the observer stuff here, you know? Dude, so, okay, the things that were really cool is, like, like there's just, like, stuff you're not going to think about until you go into, like, a, an active war zone, right? So, like, the bus, you know, coming in, like, it's going on the highway, and there's, like, a military checkpoint every so often. And, like, you know, if you're going by car, like, sometimes they'll stop and ask you for passports and stuff like that. But I was, you know, on the bus most of the time, so I didn't really get that. Um, and, like, you can see, like, the little bunkers they have off to the side of the road. Um, or, like, when you're there, you know, like, you hear, the, like, the missile alert siren or whatever. And it's just, like, oh, you can go down to the bomb shelter. And, like, dude, it's fascinating, like, um, watching, like, how people react. Because it's, like, you know, 10% of people are just, like, they're just, like, outside the bomb shelters. And they're just, like, chilling, you know, just, like, waiting for all this crap to be done. And then there's, like... you know, 80%, they're like inside the bomb shelter and they're just like, uh, you know, and then there's like another 10% that are just kind of like freaking out, you know? Like, uh. And so um, I got to see like uh, the Patriots, like actively intercept like a Russian missile, like, you know, see like the trails of smoke here, like the booms and stuff like that. So that was, um, That's exciting. dude, it was like, yeah, it was an experience. Like, uh, like that's, that's some really new, any stuff Yeah. like, yeah, yeah. No, It I was can, good. I can, I can, uh, I can imagine how exciting that would be. That would be like, oh my god, this is so cool. I know it's not cool to be in a war zone, but it's kind of, it kind of is at the same time. Um, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, chatting with people there and just being like, you know, because like I would talk with people who are from like none of us, right? And they're just like, you know, it's been, you know, like nine years ago, like Russia rolled in and like we just kind of had to run away from there. And then like, oh, then Russia rolled in again. We had to like, run away and so it's yeah it was just a great experience You know, the stuff that you're describing to me, um, it reminds me of a Jordan Peterson book, 12 Rules for Life. And um, I don't know if you've read that book. Have you gotten a chance to read that book before or listen to the audio? no so i'm the kind of person where sometimes i'll just look at like the wiki page and be like oh there are the 12 rules Oh, I see. Um, Okay, I think that one is actually worth checking out, even if you skim through it. I, I think it's pretty good. Actually, I, I was very impressed with, uh, I did the audiobook for that one. And it was really long. I was like dreading it because I have demon consume, right? And I'm like, oh God, it's like, I don't know. I don't remember how long it was, like 14 to 17 hours long. It's like, how, how, can, you, how can you talk for 17 hours or something? You know, like, like, this, like there must be some, it's, this, must, this has to be profound or I'm going to be mad that I listened to this the whole thing. Um, I did listen to it. I was impressed. Like, oh, it's actually pretty good. I did keep, uh, keep my attention. Um, and like a lot of the concept he talked about the book, I still bring up because I feel like it's so good for, uh, Like just in general, as a as a human being, you know, um, is there any observer issues happening? Yeah, someone tried to call me, <laughs> and there was a little like pop up thing oh, here. yeah, So sorry. no worries. Yeah, I was like, oh, observer alert. But anyways, um, anyways, in his book, he uh, talks about like, uh, never disturb kids who are playing skateboard. I'm paraphrasing the exact thing, but that's what he said, right? And then, uh, basically, the he said that oh. When kids are skateboarding, it seems dangerous. They can fall, they can get hurt, right? But eventually the kid, they build up competencies and they don't fall as much anymore. They don't get hurt anymore. So his conclusion is um, competency um, equals safety.
that's his, uh, uh, you know, theory. That's his, and, and it's totally true, right? And like the way I see it is, um, it's kind of like a counter IJ kind of concept. Maybe it's a message more to the IJs because the IJs are being like, don't do that. That's scary. That that you could get hurt. Blah blah blah. Right? Or if you're like an OI, right? But then, what if it does happen? Because real life happens, and you can't get around it, and you don't know how to navigate because you didn't expose yourself to 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 getting hurt or being in danger, right? You know. Um. So it's kind of like you going to Ukraine and. Uh, You've been in a war zone, so it, you kind of have some experience being in this kind of situation. So should it happen again in another place, and let's say it's your hometown in either, uh, you know, in the U.S. or in Germany, you're going to be like, oh, I've been to a situation like this before. I'm going to be okay. I know what to do. I know what the drills are. Or at least you have an idea, right? But the people who hasn't, they're not prepared. You're right. You know, uh, it's you can't do mind simulation for it. It's not the same as being there, right? You know, because it's like unforeseen sensory chaos and people chaos is going to happen and you won't know how to to deal with it. So um, so that's kind of like my thought process when you when you went there. I was like, oh, you're doing the the thing, like the competency equals safety thing. Yeah, I got some thoughts on that. Do you mind if I take like a 30 second observer break? Yeah. I've got a <clears throat> shit. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, there's um this guy. He's at the hotel already here. Uh, I'll tell him, let's meet up, uh, later, 8.30, so, no, so, <clears throat> uh, this is how kind of sleep last I am, uh, in that, you know, so I went, um, to work, basically, I worked in the Uber down to, like, the, uh, office, um, and then I like came back here, you know, I like ran out to lunch, you know, I'm like meeting up with, uh, this, um, coworker, you know, who, uh, just came, uh, or just flew in. And then like, when that's all done, I have like a letter that I should write to someone or a message I should write to someone. I have like this backlog of like a few other messages I should get to. I've got like, uh, I think two or three work tasks that I'm supposed to do tonight. And it's like, I'm not going to get all this done. Like, uh, I'll just, um. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Like, you know, OE, I'll figure it out. And um, yeah, it'll work out somehow. But hey, you know what? I'm thinking now about your type that I find interesting. You have Blast Savior as an ENTP, which is not very common. You know, you don't see very many ENTPs with Blast Savior. I'm actually very fascinated about this animal. Um, Double Feminine SF Blast. Like, uh, What's going on with uh for that animal for you, dude? Because that's that's uh that's a really uh, unique spin to to your type. I think that's like the one that people would probably be the most curious about. It's like you're an EP with Blast Savior. What's that like, right? So especially an ENTP, like um, I don't remember the last time I interviewed a a play Blast ENTP. I think I did a while back, but it's you guys are not common for sure. Like you guys are, uh, more rare. Yeah, you've interviewed I think three people of my type before, um. So, uh, I've watched because Kendrick, you a YouTube channel. What, what? Um, yeah. So, okay. So play blast. I put down a note, uh, and then I want to like, um, get back to what you said about the Jordan Peterson sure. thing. And then I, you know, I would respond to that because I want to, you know, I would acknowledge and uh, roll with, you know, some of the good stuff you're putting out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. basically, yeah, like I think I'm a hundred percent with you on the Jordan Peterson note. Um, we're basically, <clears throat> I think the world is like with SI at the bottom, it's kind of terrifying. Like when you don't have like the shit um, that, you know, like, uh, and then when you like, uh, have you heard of these um, studies where basically they look at people who have mastered their craft, like when they're doing it and it's like their mind is asleep basically. Yeah. So it's like, if you sleep last, the way to get to your sleep is to build mastery. Yeah. Boom. There it is. Um, We'll, yeah. we'll go into detail about that later because that, that's your ST sleep, right? So that's that's a good one. We'll, we'll, yeah, but anyways, keep going. Yeah, so um uh yeah, with the um uh play blast. So I think typically like with um blast savior, because it's uh usually like blast first or it's like sleep last, right? 
Um, and then play blast is sort of like the 25% chance of getting play blast, right? So we're like a lot more chaotic, I think, than your typical blaster, right? So I'm like, I'm talking with someone right now, you know, and this, this, uh, lady is, um, she is some kind of blaster because it's like, you know, like we'll like chat or whatever, you know, and she's just like, you know, she's like repeating what I'm saying and she's like saying it back to me. And then there's like this little bit of extra new information. Whereas like, um, and I, I see that as like stereotypical blasting where it's like, here's what you said. And, oh, there's 5% of what I think too, or whatever, you know? Um, and then, uh, the, uh, I think what play blast does is it says like, oh, you know, like, here's what you said and here's this other thing and here's this other thing and here's what I think, you know, and I'm going to say what I think, you know, and you sort of like, like it's um like blast savior is just kind of like da -da 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 -da, and then it kind of like bounces around right whereas like play bass kind of like bounces around and then it's like da -da 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 -da. does that make sense yeah it sounds like you're um sharing all the different tribe perspectives first and then you have the blast conclusion in the end like after you presented all the the different perspectives of of the tribe you know what i mean like uh, for example i did that jordan peterson You know, I'm like, that's that's a, a perspective from the tribe, right? You know, and then I had a conclusion about it, which is uh, competence equals safety. You could actually argue also for e ENTPs, actually, competence equals freedom, right? I think that's like a really good saying, I think, for for the e for, for your type, competence equals freedom, right? Because then with competence, you can do any anything <laughs> pretty much, right? Um, we're in this topic already. Why don't we just jump in? A, a sleep loss, ST sleep loss. So your sleep, your inner identity is tied to competence. Um, Dave, during my interview with him, again, I'm using my play to cite the tribe member here, said that SD sleep is the hardest sleep animal there is. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. But yeah, really? It's, yeah. It's He said the easiest is NF sleep and then NT sleep and then SF sleep and then ST sleep. So you guys have the hardest sleep animal uh, and the most um, the most troubling also. Uh, so he, he said that NF sleep is the chillest while the ST sleep is the less chill, the, the least chill of all the sleeps. Um, knowing he, knowing that his perspective, what's the first thing that came to mind about yourself when you heard that? Well, see, when I was typed, like one of the first things, you know, one of the like responses I had was like, oh, how do I work, you know, on my ST sleep? And, you know, Dave's response was like, oh yeah, you know, that's easy. Just like take a nap or whatever, or, you know, like rest or whatever, like Yeah. physically rest. Um, so, uh, <laughs> like that kind of makes me laugh a little bit, but I think going to your point about like ST, um, there's like, so it's ST, you know, and also like, I don't have the flex, right? So the, the sort of sleep part of things is like, it's actually something I put a lot of work into. So I think one of the reasons that I, you know, spent a lot of time with my type is because I feel like, you know, I've been fairly in touch, you know, with who I am. Um, so for instance, I could be like, yeah, you know, like I want this, I'm kind of like generally like this. I know in these types of situations, like um, I do, you know, this kind of thing. Um, And I think the, the sort of difference with like uh, ST sleep is that, hmm, sorry, I think the, I just kind of went a little too far with that. So I'm gonna pull it back a little bit. Um, so, okay. So ST sleep, uh, like I can't really hide from ST sleep, right? Cause like if it's sleep, you know, you're sufficiently, you've had sufficient sleep or you haven't. Um, also, you know, as an NF, right? I think it's, we, I'm like the most spacey, you know, out in the mystical world, you know, type that there is theoretically. And so it's like very obvious at what I suck at, you know? Whereas I think if you're just like a, you know, TE and SE on top, like, you know, it's not so obvious, right? So I think that that forces me, you know, to work on that stuff, right? Um, 
because you can't like lie to yourself and say like, oh, you know, I could, you know, I'm like one of the fastest and strongest people. I'm just like, no, like I can put myself in a race. I can like, um, you know, I can lift the weights and like, I can actually have some proof of where I'm at. Right. So I think um, it may be that uh, with ST at the bottom, like I'm forced to face my shortcomings more so than someone with NF at the bottom. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird, you know, thinking about this as a number four, uh, because like I theoretically have flex last, right? Um, but I think there's also... Like, if we think about, like, internal and external motivation, like, I think, like, like this NE, FE on top, right? I'm, like, taking in tribe values all the time, nonstop, constantly, you know, double activated. And so, <clears throat> like, I know, like, what people value in a human being, and I kind of understand where I fall short. And so it's just, like, all this external tribe pressure on me, you know, to sort of uh, hit my ST sleep more or less. So uh, in high school, I was actually like a cross country runner. And so did fairly well. Like I broke some uh, school records, um, you know, got like onto a D1 cross country team um, that ended up winning nationals uh, two years later. So they were reasonably good, reasonably good. Um, and so that was my like, yeah, I'm ST, yeah, you know, sort of thing. Um, and I, I think I would have a, a quick question for you. Like, it's sort of like running and walking, you know, like say like long distance, is that kind of like an SITI thing or is that like an SI thing? Have you seen? Well, the running thing, I don't think so because I think everyone, every type runs, um, you know, you know, the motivation is a little bit different, um, walking, It's it's hard to say because I feel like walking, everyone does walking also. Um, I think the biggest difference is um for us, where we walk has to be different. We can't walk in the same place all the time or we'll get bored. Well, like the other types might not get bored because the motivation is different, right? Like if you look at David Goggins, the goal is to toughen up his character, you know, mm -hmm. the NF sleep, right? That the double mask on NF sleep. So He's building character, so he doesn't care what the surrounding is. As long as it builds character, that's what matters. Um, I I have noticed for ENFPs and ENTPs, the one thing that we do have in common, we don't like the same place. Like, it has to be a new place. We're happy to go the distance, no matter how difficult it is, to, to go traverse it either by walking or trekking, hiking, whatever. It has, as the, the only criteria is it has to be different. You know, the moment's the same. Oh, that is pain. That is pain. You know, so, yeah. so that's that's my perspective on what you just said. Yeah. So, like walking is a mode of exploration, more or less. It, it is, but it has to be different. It has to be a different setting, different setting. Yeah. yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yes. Yeah. Um. So I was just thinking about what you said. Also, so it sounds like um. As a number four, you have to use specialization to kind of circumvent the lack of flex. Because you're kind of flexing when you're specializing in something, you know, you're not doing it with the purpose of being egotistical. You're doing, but you're doing it um, out of the craft of um, doing it the correct way. You know what I mean? So, but in a way, that's also in a way that it's like a subtle flex because you're doing the right thing to Do, to get the job just right. And uh, in a way, that's kind of like a flex, in my opinion. A little, But it's not like an egotistical flex. It's like, you know, like more like a responsible kind of flex, you know? Like, I, I feel responsible for doing the right thing. Yeah, so I think, like, the mastery is, like, a really strong pull, you yeah. know, for me. So, like, Robert Greene has a fun book on mastery. You know, yeah. that's, like, catnip, the specialist, I would assume. It was to me at least. And he's an ENTP um, also, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 He's play last. He feels like a specialist. Yeah. yeah. Um so it's uh I think like 
it's like if we think about internal versus external motivation, I think like, you know, the number four takes in everything in the surroundings or a reasonable approximation of everything, right? Um, and then says like, you know, I'm taking in everything. And so out of this, you know, what are the things I care about? You know, and so it chops off, you know, the stuff they don't care about, you know, and then does their best on the things that they care about, right? And so I think like a healthy number four, you know, is someone that has really, um, you know, they just have like the sort of things that they care about are sort of pro-social, you know, for lack of a, a better word. And they're, you know, they really help them sort of like survive in life. So my boss, I'm, he's a CFO, right? He makes very good money. He's in sort of, uh, you know, he's in an executive position, managing director of multiple companies. I'm pretty sure he's a number four. Like, and like his drive is just like, like, he's just like, you know, likes being around people and he like enjoys his job, you know, and he just like, likes running around and like, uh, you know, kind of doing everything. Like kind of, I think Dave said that like, Uh, number fours in a good situation are kind of like number twos. Like, and so I think that's sort of um, what the what the goal is of like, you know, the number number four, where basically like you feel like you understand the situation at such a deep level that you can freelance across the situation. And then you're doing like a really good job, you know, everything you're sort of touching. Like that's sort of the dream for like a number four, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the amazing thing about number four bosses is Warren Buffett. Did you see that video that Dave did on him? Where like he had the photograph of his employees and they're exact same one, like so many years later, like the exact same people, like no one has left. And, you know, that shows you how much number fours care about, you know, other people. And like, I feel like if the number four was the boss, and you go to work, you're really well taken care of. And you don't feel like, I'm just a number, like you are part of the family, you know, like you are family and it, it's such a good feeling. Obviously, you know, you, you might have a few people that's not carrying their weight as a result of that. And you're not likely to punish them because you're like, oh, you know, we're family, just let it go. But like, you know, um, but I think it could be done correctly too. So there's, a, could be like ways around that as well. So um, I, I do want to talk to you about Sorry, did you have something to add to this? Yeah, so I was I was I was gonna say, so like I'm in finance, right? So financial planning and analysis. And so I sort of I get some exposure to the executive team around like forecasting the future um and sort of planning, you know, the future. And what that can mean is that as a number four, so any FE, I also have to forecast layoffs, which is like, you know, like in Star Wars episode four, where they're just like, I felt a great disturbance in the force, right? Yeah. But it's just like, they're asking you to model how much, you know, money are we saving, you know, by like cutting headcount and stuff like that. You're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it's like a knife, like you're getting knifed, but funny anecdote. Yeah, I think twos and fours would feel very uncomfortable and hurt doing that. But I feel like if you were like a one, it's like, <laughs> you know like yeah. and yeah another day in the office you know <laughs> um so it gets a little bit dark in that aspect um i want to go back to the sd sleep again i know dave told you when you asked how you should work on it he just said sleep i think that's just one aspect of it um there's so many dimensions to sd sleep so i actually want to touch on the other aspects of it um so one aspect is very, very similar to SF sleep. So uh, for SF sleep, they described it as having health routines, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the FI is like the health routine that makes you feel good, right? But for TI, it's a health routine that works. So it's, there's a little bit difference, right? Because one has to feel good. The other one doesn't have to necessarily feel good, but it has to work, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it's the same dimension as the SF sleep. in regards to, I don't know if you saw my video when I did my SF sleep um, update. You see that video that I made? If not, it's okay. Like it's like I did a, I did a full explainer video on my SF sleep journey. So I'm guessing no, but it's okay. Um, I've seen a bunch of your videos. I saw, so actually I'm pretty sure my, uh, so I was married and then divorced and I'm pretty sure she was like, uh, 
SF Sleep first. Like, um, yeah, sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. A a anyhow, um, part of the SF and ST sleep routine is exercise, nutrition, physical sleep, and mental health, right? So we've kind of talked about the physical sleep a little bit. So what about the other three? Um, how is your exercise routine like? How is your eating healthy, your healthy eating habits like? And how is your mental health routine like? Super healthy, can't you see? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Um, so the eating healthy, you know, kind of comes and goes. The exercise comes and goes. However, I get 10,000 steps a day on average. So, Nice. um, and mental health, yeah, I mean, it's reasonable. So I can dive into my backstory a tiny bit, but basically, long story short, in the course of like one year, I basically... Um, my wife died of cancer, lost my stepchild. I moved to another country and yeah, of course I quit my job and started a new one. Right. So I've had lots of stuff happen in my life in Oh like God. very short periods of time. So, yeah. How are you dealing with that? Like, you know, how did you sleep process all that? Because that's pretty intense, all that stuff that you just described. So I think as Dave would say, it's not that you can't do your last animal. It just takes longer, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it just takes a while. Put in the reps and you get there eventually, yeah. Well, sorry to hear that, dude. Um, I hope that you're managing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, at this point in time, you know, I've like uh, put in the reps. Um, yeah, and of course, I think the, the sort of weird part about like, grief you know especially with something like that is you like to move on like you have to make it a part of you in some ways and like to have it be like um a good sort of you know moving on like you almost have to be glad that it happened like it's really weird to say that but Right. like you have to be like oh my god you know i'm like so thankful you know for like the time you know that i had You know, with that and like, you know, like as much, you know, as I didn't want, you know, her to die, right? Like, um, it's, it's almost like you have to just say like, yeah, it's, it's weird, you know, and of course it's probably not fully sleep processed, um, but it's almost like you have to say like, hey, it was super difficult, um, Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult to say at the end, you know, like sleep less, let's just say it like that. Um, yeah. Like you almost have to sort of be glad that you went through something like that. Like, I think when you're fully processed, like you can acknowledge, you know, that you were super sad. And of course with extroverted feeling, it's kind of funny. Like I don't feel sad for myself. Like I just feel like super sad, you know, for her. Right. Cause like she didn't want to, so she, um, like she was in her thirties when she died. Yeah. So that's like, uh, that was obviously not, I think what someone in their thirties would expect, you know, to have happen. Um, you know, and so she just couldn't accept it, you know? And, uh, like it took her like a couple days, Uh, until a couple days before she eventually passed, before she was like ready to admit, you know, that she was like going to die. So, I mean, I don't really feel sorry for myself, really. I think um, I feel sad, you know, that she didn't get to live out her life, right? I feel sad, you know, for um, so for her daughter. So kind of weird situation where basically she wasn't legally like my adopted daughter or anything like that. And so... She was from uh, another country. And so basically talking with the lawyer after my wife had passed, you know, talking with, you know, her grandparents, you know, in the other country, it was like, hey, look, you know, legally you have an obligation to send her back there. You know, I talked with the kid and, you know, she was like, yeah, I want to go back with my grandparents. I don't want to stay in America, you know. And so I had to also like, you know, take, um, you know, my daughter to the airport more or less. Right. And be like, you know, bye. You know, I'm probably not going to see you for a while. you know, and basically just, uh, you know, kind of lose a daughter as well, right? Um,
Yeah. So I'll start. Which country is she from? Or did she move Japan. to? Japan. Oh, oh, so they're Japanese then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Ironically. Oh. She was living in Canada when we uh got together, so. It's interesting to hear your perspective about grief and stuff because you feel bad about the other person uh, because it's F-E, right? It's not F-I. So, um, <laughs> like, cause I was thinking about that situation when you were explaining it to me. And, like, for me, the, my first thought was, like, ah, that's horrible that it happened to her because it's like getting the rug pulled under you, right? You still have a lot that you want to do, and now you can't do it anymore. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so... It's kind of like the way I think about my life too. It's like, as an EP, I'm like, tomorrow is not promise. So there are certain things that might not be the most logical decision for now, but it's good to do them in case there is no tomorrow. I think that's that's the, the way I see it. Um, like I've been to like, you know, earlier I was flexing, I, I went to 102 countries, right? And I always think about like, if I die, if I die tomorrow, how would, like, would I be, would I have regrets? And I'm like, I have less because I've done it. And it's not the most logical decision from a financial standpoint because I'm traveling so much, spending all this money. But from that perspective, I'm like, oh, if the rug does get pulled under me, I I think I would be able to accept the fate easier because I didn't have all these things on the back end waiting that needs to be done. You know what I mean? Like an IJ lifestyle. And you said that she's might, she might be an IJ, like sleep first, right? So- like maybe an ICJ, it's like maybe that's how you describe her. Yeah, so, I so I've I've had a complicated life story. I was married young, got divorced. Yeah, that didn't work out. And then the second wife, it was just like it was great. I think she was actually like an ISFJ or something like that. Okay. Um. So she was also an IJ. Um. But yeah, yeah, I think she was yeah ISFJ, uh, as you say IJ, but that. That has to be like an EP thing because like that's honestly been like a metric that I've used as well. Like, you know, if I died tomorrow, you know, like, would I be happy? Like, does that sort of like, am I, will that I regret, you know, what I do? Right. No, I mean, it makes sense to us, but other people might think you guys are nuts. But So I, I don't know. Um, I, I do want to ask you about um, all the divorces that you've had or loss of um mm -hmm significant other um you're number four so friends and family is the most important thing to you but then there is a pattern of this happening to you um what are your thoughts on that uh personally you know like uh, like can you share with me the f and the t of of that like you know how you felt you know when the separation happened and also the ti truth of it when you got a chance to actually mm -hmm. Think about it yeah so i think the first you know so i dated this woman in college and then got married you know pretty shortly after and so that was more like uh oh people around me are doing it like let's do it this is like what you know you get married you know like at a certain point and so it was just kind of like you know you're looking around you you're taking in the external information you're just like oh yeah you know like the relationship's okay yeah and then, um, you know, it turns out when you see someone like uh, two, three times a week, that's different from seeing them every single day, right? That's different from having your like life tied inextricably with theirs. Uh, and so you sort of live and learn. And it is the most incredibly hard thing to do. Maybe as a number four, maybe, you know, like FE, you know, whatever it is, it's just like, like breaking up with someone is incredibly hard um, that for me. And then, yeah, I would say for like uh, with when my wife died of cancer, like um, there's actually a stress scale. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called the Holmes-Rahe stress scale. And it's sort of like an objective measure of like um, add all these up to see how likely you are to have a mental breakdown over the next two years, uh, you know, kind of score. <clears throat> and so they put divorce there as like 50 or 60 and like death of your partner is like a hundred, like that's the top of the scale. Um, so, I mean, I think for whoever, you know, like the death of a partner will hit you 
and it will hit you in different ways, right? Because like if you're, um, if you're a decider, it's just like, oh, like my person, you know, who I'm like decider weird about, you know, is like no longer here, right? And then if you're like an observer, you're just like, oh my God, like my sort of, my OI, you know, if you're an IP is gone, or if you're like an IJ, you're just like, maybe you're just like, oh my, you know, like this new source of new in my life, you know, is gone or whatever, right? So for me, it was like, I mean, first of all, you have to deal with the grief, right, of losing it. Um, second of all, you have to deal with a completely new, like, living situation, you know, and then third of all, you have to, like, figure out, like, what you do and where you go, and it was quite difficult, like, I would say it took me about, like, two-ish years to get back to normal, so. It sounds like the processing time for you is, it takes a long, it takes a while. Uh, it's, I mean, the death of your partner, that is going to take a lifetime, in my opinion, like to, to really fully grasp it, you know, um, because that's, that's, you know, the scale that you mentioned is like, if it's like a hundred, that's, it's not going to be something that, um, you know, will take two years, right? Like versus like just a divorce, but your part, your ex-partner is still alive, right? You know, and you can still wish the best for them. So, um, so I think, in that case yeah um yeah dude there's so much stuff that happened in your life eh like it's i think the the crazy thing about you is you have like a very sunny exterior but all these dark things happen to you you know like and i'm 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 i i appreciate you sharing it cuz these are not easy topics to talk about so i you know um you know like sleep processing this is going to be difficult but you did say earlier that uh you know everything that happens could be A positive thing and i think um quite honestly like any event that is very traumatic is the fastest way to access sleep your sleep it's obviously you don't you don't want that to happen but it happened already so to make the most of it it's that's like the positive benefit for you is you know you'll be able to sleep process better now because it's such a intense uh situation that happened um all right dude um I have another appointment coming up. So before we wrap up the interview, um, I want to ask two last things, okay? Uh, first mm -hmm. one is, is there anything that we didn't address during this interview that you wanted us to talk about? Or is there something about yourself that you want people to to know that uh, we haven't discussed into detail? So I'm opening the platform to you for this. Yeah. Yeah, everyone should like and subscribe to Kendrick Yui's uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, woo woo. Um, <laughs> um, basically, I I mean we've touched on a lot of things. Um, so we haven't really touched as much on sort of masculine TI number three. I think that uh, you know that's that's sort of an interesting one for me. Like I think if you talk about grief, I think in some ways it's actually uh easier to be i think ti than it is fi because like fi it's like you know like that's like something that'll always kind of like be there and like it's it's just like the chemicals you know like won't change whereas with ti i think it's like you can like logic and reason yourself a little bit you know to be like okay you know i know she died and like you know i know that i miss her but like i know she died you know and it's just like you can still miss her and stuff but i think it it it's a little bit different um i do want to say that I appreciate, you know, everything that you're doing. So you've been doing this for like four or five years now. Is that right? Uh, I started in 2019. I think Dave was my first interview. So yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. What is it now? 2024? What is that? Four years? Five, yeah, years? five years? Something like that? Yeah. 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 So dude, you've, um, I think your interviews, I think they have been incredibly helpful, you know, for someone like me, you know, because as I was sort of you know, like looking around, trying to figure things out, um, you know, like Dave and Chan, like they have their types, right? But, you know, like any FE, like there are like maybe three type twins, you know, that are like official three, four, something like that, you know, and then you've got, like you have like one or two already, you know, my type twins. So it's just like, um, 
I think you're really providing a valuable service to the community by sort of doing these interviews. And I know it takes a lot of time and effort to do this. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for doing this. You're rocking and rolling, man. Appreciate Yeah, thank you. you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Appreciate the props. Um, yeah, I when I first started my channel, I I, I had that thought from the very beginning that um I need to do interviews because double activated play, it was the best way for me to stay consistent. You know, being EP, consistency is the, our biggest enemy, right? So I felt like that that was the way to uh I have a fallback to no matter what, that the interview can keep going. And I remember I spoke to Dave about it, and Dave said to me, Yeah, dude, just do the interview stuff. Um, it's going to be slow for you at first, the interview, but like later on, it's going to be good, but it takes time, you know? And then I think it's just like the past year or two where I'm starting to realize, I'm like, oh, I built up a massive library of interviews that people can now access of professionally tied individuals, not, not BS. Cause I, I as an info dumb, I get so annoyed at fake, Yeah, type of yeah. but like this Self-typing. are. Yeah, self-typing. Oh God, that is the worst. Like people, when people say, "Oh, I, I know, I type myself as this." I'm so sure. I'm like, oh, God. I'm like I've interviewed so many people. I have, I, I can tell you, dude, less than one percent type themselves correct. That is, that that's like a lot of people may might have typed the Myers Briggs correctly, like maybe like five percent, but the exact the exact type, less than one percent. It's really bad. Okay, so I don't think. People should be cocky and be like, I know myself more than anyone else. You're like, maybe you know your sleep animal, but you don't know, do you know your, what your blast looks like? Do you know what your play look like? Do you know what your consumer look like? You know, like maybe, you know, there's like different parts of you, right? Um, So, yeah. So I, I appreciate your compliment because uh, I, I do take do take pride in uh, having the biggest library of Woo, flex, like, flex. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I flex. I a hundred percent flex that. You know, like, like I'll be the Joe Rogan of uh interviews. You know, eventually. Um, Dude, you got to find your consistency. Flex the shit out of it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do think about that. I know, I know. It's I I I have demon flex like you, so I hate like bragging and stuff. But like, when when I do think about it, like I see people coming in and starting their own interviews. I'm like, oh, you do your. I'm like, oh, you're really behind. Like I'm five years ahead of you. So you know. Like, I don't think you're going to catch up, you know, um, but there's room. There's always room, um, you know, there's Coke and Pepsi, right? So uh, there, there could be a second one, uh, whoever's willing to be consistent. So we'll, we'll find out, I guess. Um, anyways, Ben, uh, thanks for reaching out and uh, doing this interview. Um, you're, I know you gave me the, a lot of flowers, so I give you the flowers back in regards to that. Um, your type is not common, and it's good that people see a representation of what your type is like. So... I'm happy that you came on board and uh, you represented your type, you know, so you, you represent your, your peeps essentially. Well, thank you to all y'all out there who are FF, any FE, play blast, consume number four, or some sort of similar type. Yeah. Feel free to hit me up. Rock and roll. All right. Take care, dude. <laughs> Catch you later. Bye-bye.